Hey everyone. Um, so, as I was saying, my name is Alex Hayes, and, and I'm here to talk to you about how to build uh, your successful data science team within your organization. Um, first, a little bit about me. Uh, I've been in data science now for the better part of, of over six years, and I've been an employee, a uh, consultant, and advisor to many companies across many different industries, some of which include online dating, um, healthcare, e payments, e commerce, banking, government, hospitals, you name it. I've, I've certainly uh, been around the block in that sense. But during that time, I had a unique opportunity to sit down with all these other data science teams for all those other companies and kind of go, what's, what's working? What, what differentiates a really good team from an average team from a so so team? I mean, that's kind of the point of the talk today is, you know, let me go ahead and try and distill what it is I've learned to kind of give you guys that knowledge. So it's not so much my opinion of what I think works well, as opposed to here's what I have observed that does work well for the places that I've been. Um, as an aside, I've also done, done a little bit of work on my own um, to come up with things that you may or may not have, have heard about. I, I developed a model to predict pass or run for Bill Belichick. Uh, it turns out that Brady and Belichick are like a dynamic duo. They go back 15 years. And, and so um, this model can predict pass or run, but obviously for the last three weeks it hasn't been doing well because Brady's on suspension. Um, I've also done a lot of work in the wine industry, predicting what vintage years of Bordeaux are going to be there. Um, and we're using deep auto encoders to do that. Um, I've done some work for the city of Chicago to predict arrest rates for given crime. And uh, currently I'm the co-author of Mastering Machine Learning with Apache Spark. Um, so, with that, one of the things I was thinking about was, you know, who's the intended, what's the intended audience for this talk? So I think there are three people kind of in this room. And the first one is perhaps you have a data science team, um, and you know maybe it's all built, or maybe you're looking to add some pieces to it, and you want to know what pieces you should add. Or you're you're, you're here at this conference and you're stoked. You, you've heard you've heard dark data all over the place, and now you want to go do dark data. You want to invest in AI, but um, you don't know where to start. Or um, you want to know how other people set up their teams for success, and that's kind of this is kind of where I want to focus my talk is is on the latter pieces. How how other teams do it, and so what I've come up with is I've come up with what I call the empirical four. Um, and we're going to talk about each one of these specifically, but the first one is the number of developers greater than or equal to the number of data scientists. And the second one is working AI instead of perfect AI. The third, and, and this is one we're going to spend quite a bit of time on, is executive buy-in. And the fourth, and this is very figurative, is, is get hit in the face often. So, let's start with... Uh, Number of developers greater than or equal to number of data scientists. So, um, oftentimes uh, we think of data science as this wheel of maths, computer science, and domain expertise. And that's true, but it's lacking in one fundamental piece, and that's execution. And the execution part is just as important as the math, the computer science, and the domain expertise. If you can't bridge the gap between discovery, and, rea and, and reality in a data-driven application, then all you've effectively done is run the hello world example for something. And, and we've all done that many times, right? I mean, we don't need to go over MS for the thousandth and tenth time. So there's, there's no point in, in, in really moving beyond hello world unless you can execute. And to do that, you need a series of both front-end and back-end developers. So I have yet to meet, and you know, I, I will admit to this, I have yet to meet the data scientists that doubles as also a full stack developer. Those guys are called magical unicorns. Um, and if you've got them, that's incredible. But um, of all the places that I've been to, it turns out that the developers are actually on the same team as the data scientists. Because the data scientists are saying, here are the inputs. You need to take those inputs and maybe you, you, you put them into a queue where you, those inputs get fed into a stream and you have a Spark streaming application or something like that, and it does some job, you want to write that out to some other queue, for example. Well, all that needs to be hardwired, um, and this is kind of where your developers come in to help you execute your AI, to help you get beyond what lives on your laptop and something in the real world. 
one of my all-time favorite memes here. Um, working AI versus perfect AI. So, so what do we mean by this is that at the time of research, what I found with these teams is that they're going to do their best to try and capture all the use cases um, for their technology. So they're going to sit down and they're going to they're going to take a deep dive and say, are we covering all of our bases? Are we taking? Are we? Is the baseline assumption that we're building our AI solution is it, is it valid? Are we taking into account all the inputs that we possibly can? And, and more often not, they are, but they, they only know what they know. And so um, it's, it's what, what they're going for is let's deliver a minimum viable product knowing that at the end of the day, when real data starts being thrown at it, they're going to iterate from that. So it's, it's having the ability to say, you know what? Is this better than what I have today? Yes, good, that's progress. So now let's take that, let's put that in, and then let's get, let's see how it reacts in the real world. And that's going to be the fourth pillar that we're going to talk about. So um, if you can't recognize it, this is Gandalf when he, when he holds the staff and says, you shall not pass. But if you were to say, what's the one pillar, Alex, that undermines or determines the success of the data science team? I, I think it's this one. This is executive buying. So, what do I mean by that? I don't mean, you know, here boss, here's the monthly AWS bill, cut the check and, and thanks for that every month. What I mean is that the executive team, upper management, if you will, is actually a partner with the data science team. And their input is just as valuable as any other member's input is as well. The other thing that executive buy-in does is it facilitates a flattened corporate hierarchy. So as part of a data science team, a really good one, the ones that I've seen is they're able to pull in different resources, run experiments for a long or a short amount of time, and basically traverse um, across different groups of an organization seamlessly because the executive buy-in was there. It starts at the top and it goes down. Unfortunately, as part of the experience I have, I've also been, in, I, I've worked with data science teams where that's not there. And what ends up happening is you have a bunch of really smart people who come together and have an idea, but the guy that they're selling to is a middle manager, and that guy's got to sell it to another middle manager. And at the end of the day, they have to do something called budget meetings where they all sit down and they have to compete for projects that they want to get resources for. But all of this could have been uh, much easier had executive buy-in been present. And the final pillar, um, and, and this is kind of the ex-post implementation, is, is getting hit in the face often. And what that basically means, and, and, and the, uh, I think of a quote by this, this Prussian uh, general who said, no battle plan ever survived contact with the enemy, meaning everything looks good in the lab. Right? But it's when you take the AI and you deploy it and you see it in the wild, do you begin to notice chinks in the armor? Because remember, when you're deploying it, you only know what you know. And so you're going at it with the best assumptions you can about how people are going to interact. But invariably, you're going to miss some things. And so this comes to the foreseeability problem with it, which is you can't foresee everything. But what I argue is that for a lot of the really good teams, they know that ahead of time. And so if I were to say, where is AI's value? I think 30% of AI value in corporations is the development of the AI. The other 70% happens after you implement it and it gets hit in the face and then you learn to revisit those baseline assumptions and maybe tweak things here and there and possibly um, you know, try some new algorithm uh, that you fancy. Okay, so. Um, what if you do all this, right? What if you've actually done all that? You have an army of developers, um, you know, you, you're, you're in favor of an iterative approach, you have executive buy-in, and you're willing to take your lumps along the way. Does that, does that mean uh, mission accomplished? And the reality is, is that's only half the goal. That's only half of where you want to be. It's a good start, but it's not, it's not the comprehensive end-to-end. -end. And, and I can think of no better video to show you in the next slide than one that has Kobe Bryant, Richard Branson, and Tony Robbins hearing the same Nike commercial. Can I get some help playing? 
I've uh, successfully gone to the bottom of the ocean. Mm, me too. And I've successfully gone to outer space. Did I? I feel like I'm already living success at success. You what? Right. I'm just wondering what's left. Richard Branson, you have achieved success at success. Congratulations. But have you achieved success at success at success? No. No, I haven't. I'm sorry, Kirk Brown. You can do better. I know you can. Good luck to you, Richard Branson. Make me proud. So, um, the point of the movie is, is you know, obviously we're, we're not going to go to outer space just yet, but the, the idea is, is once you've got AI, you've deployed it, and you're seeing how it interacts, that's only half of it. That's just success at success. But success at success at success is actually when you realize that AI becomes a living asset for your company. And like all living assets, it needs to be nurtured, you need to revisit it, you need to do different things, you need to try something new um, and, and constantly iterate. Like I was working with an online payments company, one of the biggest in the world. And, and the argument I'll make is when you work with a fraud team, these guys are employed every day of the year. It's not just we, we got a fraud solution, put our feet back and we're good. Because the reality is tomorrow's gonna happen and people are gonna figure out a way to defraud other people knowing that their old methods don't work. And so the idea is it's a constantly evolving thing where they're constantly having to re-update um, and, and, and create more. Um, and so I think, I think it bridges, it, it, it calls a phenomenon which I've observed at a few companies now it's what I call the crockpot phenomenon. It's where you set it and forget it, right? Like you, you deploy your AI and you, you say it's good and, and you, you just forget it, just like your crockpot. And what ends up happening is, is then it becomes stale and, and it's making decisions that you didn't foresee and maybe they're not the right decisions. And so the way you thwart that, the way you go against that, is if you're constantly nurturing it and you're constantly upkeeping that. I, I think that's, that's, that's a topic that's not discussed. Very often when we get AI, when we see these papers that are put out by, by Google and whatnot, we're enamored with the technology. But what we forget is after you have the technology and you deploy it, someone's got to manage it. Someone's got to put the upkeep of that. And then someone needs to tear it down and rebuild it again better. And that's one thing that I think we need to discuss a lot more. So, my final thoughts here. Um, the first one is diversity of thought is key. So at, at the best teams that I've been a part of, their data science teams are not just world-class PhD computer scientists. They understand that good data science needs to be inclusive of many roles. Some of them are data scientists, some are developers, other are business analysts, systems analysts, help desk analysts, you name it. The reality is, is that every person brings a different perspective to the table and you want to leverage that perspective. Finally, um, flatten your hierarchy. So as I said before, this works when data science teams are given the freedom to pursue experiments and to traverse across different parts of the organization to leverage what different pieces are doing. And the only way that happens is with pillar three, which is executive buy-in. So you need the executive buy-in, the message has to come from the top down, and then it trickles throughout the rest of the organization, and that's how you get a flattened hierarchy. And last but not least, this great quote by Deming. If you guys don't know Deming, definitely, definitely have a read here. Um, but it goes back to something that we've actually been hearing throughout this talk, which is, if you ask four questions, you'll get four answers. And no AI is going to save you from that one. And so careful time is needed. When you have your data science team and you're ready to unleash these guys on a problem, really take time to think about what that problem is. Because I've seen it many times where someone's going to solve something um, and it's solving a solution that no one has a problem for. So you've effectively wasted all of our time and resources by coming up with an elegant solution for which there's no problem anyways. So time taken upstream certainly helps you downstream. Um, 
And with that, that's, that's my talk, and i um, happy to take questions. Um, yeah, for the first time in history, we are ahead of schedule. So we um, are happy to take some questions. Anyone? is you have organizations that are not the developers, that are not the, uh, the uh, data scientists who are skeptical of this system in the first place. And so if you give them something that is not so great, they're going to use any flaw that they find against you and the chances of being able to continue, the chances of sustaining them and take the body may go down. How do you come that down? Yeah, that kind of comes back to asking the right question. So, so the question was, is if you give a non-data science-y company a result that's, that's not a great result, how do you come back and nitpicking that's going to happen as a result of that? Did I get that right? So the best way I can think of, and this, is, this kind of goes back to it, is, is what is the question that you're trying to ask? Really take time with that one, because I don't think formal problem definition is given the time that it deserves. Um, you know, I think I think we hastily say, you know, we I, I, I say, you know, there's a lot more people who are armchair data scientists that they read some paper and they, they they download an open source solution. They say, look, I can do deep learning in three clicks, and, 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 and you know, and here's here's the chart for that. But the reality is, is if you don't take time to formulate the problem and really think about what the inputs are. Um, then I think you're setting yourself up for failure. Because as I said, you're just gonna waste a whole bunch of people's time and money because you're not gonna come to a solution, you're gonna come to a solution for which there is no problem for, or you're gonna get lackluster results, which doesn't benefit anyone, frankly. So it, it comes back to that piece of asking the right questions. Another question? Yes? Do you expect data scientists to be a data engineer first? No. So the question was, do I expect a data scientist to be a data engineer? Um, and, and the answer I have for that is no. Um, and it's not my opinion, it's what I've seen. So um, what I've seen is that you, you have data scientists who can be data engineers, but they're not mutually exclusive roles. So you can have some guys who are thinkers and, and, and they're really good with computer science and math, but they don't necessarily need to be taking data and munging it and manipulating it. They can advise it, but they don't have to do it. So my observation is when running at scale, they always fail, algorithms fail. So they, yep. they lack that knowledge of how do I run this AI at scale. That's where I see a lot of problems. Yeah, and you know, this kind of comes back to having a team that's inclusive of different roles, right? I mean, I've, I, I, I've heard many people come to me and say, you know, hey, um, you know, we, we, have a, we have a chief data officer, and, and you know, we have data scientists, and we have a team, and I, I think that's dandy, but the reality is, is you've just got a whole bunch of smart people sitting in a corner. That, that, that's, that's no different than if I took all of us in a room and said, let's all just make some ideas together. We can do it just as well. But in order to bridge that gap between idea and reality, you're going to need data engineers. That's one of them. You're going to need business analysts. That's another one, because remember, you need the domain expertise as well. And so what I find is the best data science teams are not chock full of, of Jeff Hinton disciples, but rather they're, they're, they're different, different roles altogether. Another question? Yeah, in the back. So how does executive buy-in somehow save you from some annoying prioritization conversation? You sort of contrast the two, like executive buy-in, magic, everything works great, and then Yeah, so I think, it, as I was saying, I think it comes from the top down. Meaning, I think with executive buy-in, those are the folks that have the greater influence on middle managers than the data science is going to. So I'm saying the path from bottom up is a lot more difficult than top down. And that, the way to achieve that is if you, you are literally bringing in C-level guys into the sausage making factory, tell them about, here's what we're working on. Because it's inclusive of their opinion. And when people feel like they have ownership of something, they're much more willing to be um, uh, 
generous with their time, generous with their word, and pass that on down to other people. So I'm saying, um, rather than go bottom up each time, that I find that that never works anywhere. You want to go top down and include them all the time. Another question over there? So I'd like to follow up on that. Obviously, any project, whether it's data science or anything else, benefits from executive buy-in. What's special or different about data science where we should say we, sh we should have executive buy-in and avoid the middle management in you know, places where stuff gets stuck? Why is data science special? And how do we make that case? Well, I think, I think data science is, is, is special because by now, most companies are now hip to the fact that there's value in their data. They, they, they know one principle, which is there's value in my data. They don't know what that value is or how to unlock it, but they know that there's value. And so part of the job of the data scientist, which is, which is rarely spoken about, is they also need to play salesmen. So these people need to concoct good enough questions that deliver business value. And if that's at the form of more revenue, increased efficiency, that onus of responsibility is on the data scientists to unlock whatever that is. Because at the end of the day, what really drives business, what I find, is, is value. And if that's in the form of efficiency, or if it's money, or increased revenue, that's what's gonna, that's what makes data science so special, is we know that there's value there, we don't know what it is, and we want to go try and figure out what that thing is. I still don't understand how that's different from other, invest, other projects that might invest in. Yeah, you know, and I think that comes down to the prioritization, which this gentleman over here was talking about as well. And, and that prioritization um, happens when you include executive buy-in for people to say, hey, this is where I see this project. And typically, those people can associate a, a, a figure to that. And if that figure, what I found is, when they make that a compelling enough case, that's the prioritization that you see. cycles for what they want to do and things like that. I, I, I think we're moving towards that, but I don't think we're there now. I would like for that to be the case. So, So you have to be involved in the execution. And that execution piece, to your point, is expense. That's going to be time where you're incurring revenue, or I'm sorry, incurring costs. And these are data engineers, these are our developers who are doing that. And, and you have to be a part of the process. You can't just be an idea generator because you know anyone can do that in this room here. So it's a part of that, part of getting a company over the line and adopting it. I think what I found is that when you get that first big breakthrough, when a team can get one, 
And by one, I mean a product that goes end to end. Then finally, I think you have the clout, if you will, to make your case on other things. But you can't divorce the execution piece from the discovery piece. And that's what I keep, what I keep harping on. We have time for one more. Yep. You said something about AI maintenance and upkeep. But isn't it a little bit uh, goes against the grain of the whole paradigm of deep learning and other supervised learning where you really don't have to maintain once you have a robust model in place, you know, sort of as a part of the growth. It, it builds on itself and it stays like this. Like so can you elaborate on this? It seems like overhead that you're talking about when you say there's uh, AI upkeep and management. Yeah, so I think the question was, if, if AI is so good, shouldn't we just set it and forget it? That kind of thing, right? And the reality is, is if that was that, if that was the case, then the fraud team it delivers one thing and then they're done, right? But the reality is, is they don't. They constantly have to keep doing things because as new technologies come about, as new algorithms enter, you're going to want to try and bake those things into your solution. Case in point for, for my own for my own work is. We, we had an idea of how to accomplish something, and it was, it was AI driven, it was very much like, you know, hey, let's just turn the machine on and see what happens. But then I read about something new, and I, I thought, now that's going to be much better than what I've got before. Um, and it's actually a hybrid of both AI and something that requires a little bit more supervision. Um, and to do that, one thing that people often ask is, why did the machine produce that result? Why did it come to that decision? And if your answer is, I don't know, it just does, that, that's not going to go anywhere with, with, with people. And so one thing that I find is that it's not just the set it and forget it, but you actually have to monitor it all the time. You can't just be content with it and say, well, that's the solution, and wipe your hands with it. Yeah, we spoke yesterday a bit about explainability. Thank you very much, Alex. That was wonderful.